Good. So my name is Meg, and I am going to give you a quick tour of what I call hipster smart contracts. And these are contracts which were already trying to be smart even before blockchain was invented. <laughs> I spent a lot of time around academic hipsters because I am currently a fellow at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford, where we have an open source, open standard project to develop a programming language for contracts. Uh, very similar to some of the other efforts that we've seen. Now, we are a little contrarian in that we are not completely obsessed with blockchain, which is why we call it computable contracts, not smart contracts. And last month, about 50 people came together at Stanford to talk about use cases for computable contracts so that we don't end up with a solution to the problem. And that effort is underway, and because it's an academic effort, I expect it will bear fruit anywhere from two to three years from now, but maybe, you know, maybe soon. Now, I want to build on some of the things that were said this morning by Christopher Brewster and by Stephen Deal. Uh, this morning, we heard from Mr. Stephen, who said that the overlap between natural language and digital contracts might be very small. And if that turns out to be true, you know, I would be okay with that. Because if you are a bear of very little brain, then a small overlap is just the right size. In fact, Winnie the Pooh did say this. When it gets out into the open and has other people looking at it, this suggests to me that almost a century ago, Winnie, Winnie the Pooh had already invented such terribly modern ideas as open source, code reviews, form verification, and other things. <laughs> but coming back to the, the overlap between code and law, the inspiration for computable contracts comes from Larry Messing, saying that code is law. And the idea that law is code became very real for me a few years ago when I was working on investment agreements like this one. And I was just reading documentation like this all day long. And I thought, you know, speaking as a programmer, this language really wants to get out of Microsoft Word and into the apps. <laughs> add some implementation and some curly braces, syntax highlighting. And this is what that agreement really wants to be when it grows up, right? It wants to be a program. And once you have a program, the cool thing about this is that you should be able to take 10 lines of code and compile it back out to 10 pages of PDF. And that's called isomorphism. So that's how software works, and I think that's how contracts should work. And even the UK Law Society Gazette agrees. They call contract lawyers copy and paste monkeys, right? <laughs> and I can tell you many times I've asked my lawyer, can I please have some paperwork? They've given it to me with the previous client's name still in it, right? <laughs> so, so no wonder J.P. Morgan went and built themselves an app to replace human lawyers with just some software. Now, of course, the lawyers will protest, right? They say, we add value. But if you unbundle that value and examine it for a moment, for a linguistic perspective, we're moving up the curve from syntax to semantics to pragmatics, from what does it say to what does it mean to what does it mean for me. And that is where lawyers are used to adding value, right? But imagine a language and a compiler that can do this, right? That's, the language is called L4, here's the compiler for it, and we've turned on all the warnings, and we want to help with English, German, and Ethereum. And the compiler tells you, you know, here are some things that are wrong with your contract. You've got unenforceable clause, you've got a conflict, um, it exceeds the market norms, it knows about regulations, and so it refuses to compile your contract until you fix these bugs. And when it does compile your contract, you get English, German, Solidity, you get your make file of you know, sequential dependencies, and it shoves it into a signature backend. But this is what you want, and this is kind of what lawyers have been doing, and they haven't been very happy doing this. So, you know, I think the junior lawyers that do this today are okay with changing. So, our contribution, if you're familiar with programming, you know the if and else construct. If you know SQL, then you're familiar with the select statement. Now, our contribution to the lexicon of software will be the shall clause. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think it's possible that this will be for the legal industry what SQL did for the database industry. Hold that slide, just one right? second. <laughs> so, the novel element here is the shall That's here. Good. And if you're, you know, we've borrowed a few other words from law, so if you're a legal engineer, you get to say shall, hence, and less instead of if, then, and else. <laughs> so, uh, fees, right? But you can basically think of a contract as a big <laughs> you can think of a contract as just a big graph of these clauses. And you connect them together, and if 
you know, the party does the thing, then control passes to this other clause. And if they don't do the thing, then passes to this other clause. And that's what a contract is. And so you know, I'm starting with the language and the compiler because they form the foundation for a whole stack of technologies for legal engineering. And I use the word stack. Right? Let, me, let me explain what I mean when I say the word stack. So over the last 50 years, software engineers, who here is a software engineer? And they're like, okay, good. So we, members of our tribe, we've gone and developed a massive suite of tools just to make our lives easier, right? And this, if these tools help us do our job, at the bottom, we've got languages that are basically based on math things, the Lambda calculus. And at the top, we've got user-facing applications that show up in the app store. And in the middle, we've got all kinds of tooling and infrastructure that give you things like type checking, and unit testing, and version control, and if you're a program, you should recognize these ideas. Now, I am told that in uh, the legal industry, you know, which is structurally very similar to the, the software industry in some ways, you know, what does the legal stack look like? So I've been told that in most law firms, I'm sure President Putin accepted, the most advanced technology they have is track changes. <laughs> <laughs> They could have been programmers if they just made some better life choices. <laughs> so, so every one of these white spaces is an opportunity, and it's going to get filled in the next year. So the insight here is that really, you know, when you're drafting a contract and you're programming some software, you're doing the same thing. <laughs> but they're sort of where we were uh, back in the 1970s, right? You're writing assembly code by hand. And 50 years ago, software was proprietary, there were no high level languages, there was no open source, there was no Git, right? You'd have to hire a team of programmers to do it by hand from scratch. And it would start at $100,000. And that's where most big law firms are today, right? But if you go back, you know, I've spent the last two years in academia studying the history of this. 1960, we already had the idea that we should be able to move thinking into the machine. Right? Like, this, is, this is generations ago when people were doing this. In 1957, already, we had the idea of writing legal documents using formal logic. And they don't teach this in law school. So I came across this really interesting book in the 1970s. Uh, it was a DM session from the library, Computer Science and Law. And this is one of those books where every single chapter in this book has turned into its whole segment of the legal industry today. Like, for example, this project in 1977 tried to make tax law computable, and that was basically the granddaddy of TurboTax. Mm -hmm. um, this chapter talking about modeling legal rules, and that's what powers the expert systems in the chatbots of today. Right? Uh, this, this chapter was the granddaddy of the whole industry, which we call document assembly. And so that's, you know, the, the whole idea of a smart contract does predate blockchain. 1997, Nick Zaba was talking about this. He posted on his blog about smart contracts. And this was pretty pioneering of it because blogs hadn't even been invented yet, and smart contracts hadn't been invented. And here he was blogging about smart contracts. So <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, right? 2002, how to formalize smart contracts. And so the whole uh, academic tradition of research into the formalization of smart contracts has been going on uninterrupted for years on this. Um, there are papers that you can read about how to source contracts, how to source for law, and I've been reading a stack of papers about this thick on how to do conflict analysis, how to extract the formalization from that <coughs> language. Um, there are more papers than you can, you can imagine. And that's not even getting into the semantic web stuff, right? This is like you've got books on ontologies. So every once in a while I find something that gets me really excited. And this is the form semantics for contract language that was the subject of the PhD thesis from a few years ago. And when I saw this, I said, aha, I have found it, I found the missing link. Because this is the adapter that lets you plug the legal industry into the software industry, connect them up, thanks to this formalization which represents basically one of those clauses that I showed you. And once you do that, you can turn contracts into diagrams, you can turn diagrams into contracts. We call this a visual isomorphism, where you go from the program to the flowchart and the flowchart to the program. And there's a whole history around this. And if, you're, if, you're, if you remember the UML days, SDVR, VPNN, DNN, you'll know what I'm talking about. So the big idea, right, since we're here in the UK, if 
James Clark Maxwell were with us today, he would say, this is a game I know how to play. You take two things that everybody thinks are different, and you think very hard, and they become one thing, right? And that's called a unification. And when it comes to law, all we have to do is think very hard, and we should get another unification. It's computational law. So the reason this is possible is because contracts and programs are fundamentally the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. They're both specifications for the distributed execution business processes. That's what makes it possible for us to do this. I'm going to give you a couple of very technical examples that build on what Stephen and Chris were talking about earlier today. Should I spend a few minutes getting very technical? Yes? yes. yes. All right. All right. So Ken Adams, this guy is a lawyer who literally wrote the book on contract drafting. Um, and a few months ago, he posted this on Twitter, asking a question for the new edition of this book. How do you clarify the two sexes of the word shall? Right? In the first case, one is it's ongoing, acne shall keep the information confidential forever. Right? In the other case, acne shall pay the purchase price presumably once and not every 10 minutes. So when I saw this, I knew that we were going to win because he is asking the wrong people. He's asking linguists, but he should be asking. The geeks, right? Because we've got the math to answer this question. <laughs> and I'm going to show you exactly what the logic is. Uh, Steve was talking about LTL and CTL earlier. This is the stuff that hardware designers use to make sure that their chips don't have bugs. If you ship a CPU with a bug, the recall could cost millions. Right? When Intel had the FDIV Pentium bug, that cost 475 million. You have to get it right the first time, just on contracts. So let's use the same technology. So I'm not going to teach you CTL right now. I'm just going to show you that, that diagram on the right, that top circle represents the current state, and the lower circles represent future states. And CTL is an algebra that gives us a language to say, something will be true for every possible future, or something will be true for some possible future, or something will eventually be true in every possible future. So I'm not going to go through all the different possibilities, but the point is that Mathematicians and computer scientists and logicians have a very precise way to talk about time. And this precision is something that's sort of lacking in how lawyers are trained, I think, and that leads to drafting errors. So these kinds of terms are exactly what we need in contracts. So if you take these possibilities, we now have the equipment needed to answer his question. Right? In the first case, Acme shall keep the information confidential forever. Which one of that? Which one of these is that statement? AG, right? Yeah. As opposed to Acme shall pay the purchase price once in every future, but not after that. Right? So that's, I, would, I would say that's AF. AF, right? So AF versus AG. Now we have a way of formalizing that in a way that the can read. And that allows us to do automated reasoning. So we've seen earlier, right? The importance of ontologies and formal semantics, right? And then Humpty Dumpty says it means just what I choose it to mean. But if you are essentially solipsistic and subjective, then it's only a matter of time before you have a great fall, you trigger a runtime exception in your contract, right? So in contracts, what do you call a runtime exception? Just a lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you want you want to save that lawsuit. You want, to detect, you want to detect these bugs at compile time and not at runtime, and that's why you hire an expert sportsman to come poke holes in your code before you run. And that one way to do that is called model checking. This is one method of doing all verification. It's all method. And this is some work that was done about ten years ago, where if you take a contract, but you don't have to read this, but this is basically an SLA contract that you see in ISPs and telcos. What you do is you take every line of this contract and you translate it into the kind of algebra that we just looked at. And this is just a slightly fancier version of what I just showed you. You take line by line, boom, 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 and now you've got something that you could give to it's a so much computer. Clear. It's, so <laughs> <laughs> it's so much clearer to a computer, right? Because now you can say to the computer, here's my contract, and here's what I want the contract to do, here's this, here's what it actually does. Is this correct? And we feed these things into the model checker, and the model checker says, if there's a bug, it will give you back a possible execution trace that leads to that bug. Right? Here's a scenario that you don't want to happen, and here's how we can get to that scenario. 
And this is exactly the kind of thing that lawyers get paid to do, right? Only we can now do it in software at 10 cents an hour. <laughs> so what is my point, right? Even before <laughs> the current wave of legal tech and blockchain, uh, there has been a huge amount of academic research in this. This is the 30th year that this conference has been going on in legal knowledge and information systems. Uh, right here in London, in June, there was the IKL conference. They only run there every two years, so this is actually like the 32nd year they've done this. Uh, this was going on in Malta 10 years ago, all languages and contract-oriented software. So there is thinking about this. Unfortunately, all of this thinking was quite happily ignored by the <laughs> <laughs> people who created actual today's life yeah. contracts, which came along and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to credit this stuff, because it did, this is the, the first widespread deployment of computer contracts in the real world, and of course it went ahead, ignoring all of that. Um, and when Ethereum came along, you know, it was fantastic. You could build unstoppable applications. Um, Using things like Solidity, who here like actually knows Solidity? Yeah, okay, we've got a few hands in Viper. Anybody good in Viper yet? No, that's handy. So then the DAO happened, of course, because you know, <laughs> as, as Stephen said, it makes JavaScript look like, beautiful. Um, so obviously, this is a big embarrassment for Ethereum, and poor Vitalik had to go and do this. So it's funny, right? From a lawyer's point of view, this shows why you need this key resolution. Because if, right, this is a situation where if the only way to do a lawsuit is to have a full blown constitutional crisis, right? And there's something wrong with your governance mechanism. So, <laughs> so there's actually papers on how to grow up Ethereum smart contract, which is why we need better tools and need formal verification of Ethereum. And somebody is actually working on this today. Um, Ethereum is not the only game in town. There are other languages that these guys, how much did they raise? 200, and, like, 200 million? Is that right? 250, partly on the strength of the fact that they had a formally verifiable uh, smart contract language. You know, our friends in the room, Steven, you know, he's got his language. Uh, these guys are based out of New York, they've got their language. And you know, we've got a little thing that we've been working on as well. And uh, I'll show you an example of what we've been trying to formalize with uh, our language to show that it's not really a smart contract. We're not putting this in the blockchain. But this was the simplest hello world that we could imagine. It's a contract where if you can finish the burger, then your meal is free. <laughs> <laughs>